As violence, conflict, and bad blood between various foreign nations, Native Americans, and settlers erupted on the Western frontier, so did the coordinated battles between each side. Some of the most famous wars and the battles that came between them occurred in the American West, such as the Texas Revolution, the Battle of the Little Bighorn, and Red Cloud's War, just to name a few. However, beyond these massive conflicts and battlefields covered in bloodshed were much smaller conflicts that are mostly left out of modern-day textbooks. The truth of the matter was, there were so many miniature wars and unsettled tensions that it would take thousands of pages of text to try and summarize every single conflict that existed on the frontier. Thus, to make sense of these smaller struggles and uncover the fascinating events that led to such chaos, here are two of the lesser-known battles of the Wild West you probably haven't heard of. The history surrounding the Mason County War, also known as the Hoodoo War, originated long before its violent heyday in 1875. Rather, the story of Mason County's convoluted conflict started on the shores of the Atlantic, where immigrants from all over Europe landed in the United States with the hope to join in on the migration across America's pastures. Beginning in the 1840s, the most prevalent of these immigration pockets were Germans, and many of these Germans ventured west of the Mississippi to stake their claim to the still untamed lands of the frontier. One of the most sought after regions by migrating German Americans were stretches of Gillespie and Mason counties located in the heart of Texas. These counties were included in the Fisher Miller Land Grant, a grant sold to a German colonization company in February of 1842. The company believed it was the perfect chance to afford new opportunities to German immigrants seeking a new life. Of course, many of the people involved with Central Texas affairs opposed the land grant, as German Americans did not get a warm welcome from either already established Texans or the Native American tribes still populating the area. The most affected of these immigrants were German ranchers and farmers, constantly dealing with the local cattle rustling bands. The Germans had for years maintained an understanding of mutual respect. They would remain loyal to their new home country, but only if left undisturbed by their neighbors near and far. As the cattle and rustling operations increased, so did the ignorance shown by the fellow Texans living in the center of the Lone Star State. When trail bosses and security posses were alerted by Germans of their missing livestock, those in charge would merely shrug their shoulders. These trail bosses would even go as far as to steal the unbranded animals so that they could sell or trade their stolen goods without suspicion from buyers. Most of the trail bosses were hired on good faith that they would return shared profits to any family who allowed their unbranded cattle to go to the market, but they especially double-crossed the German ranchers much more frequently. In 1860, the tensions hit a breaking point when an unnamed tribe of Native Americans swooped through Mason County and killed recently elected Sheriff Thomas Milligan, putting on edge all of the German homesteaders over the next decade. There was also the dominating thought that a lot of the increased disrespect experienced by the German immigrants from their neighbors was due to their support of the Union Army during the U.S. Civil War, while most of Texas had sided with the Confederacy. And yet, Serious action wouldn't come underway until 1872, when two men by the names of John Clark and Dan Horster were elected by a German-American community as sheriff and cattle inspector, respectively. Sheriff Clark and Inspector Horster got right to work, assembling a team of stolen cattle hunters, hired investigators to venture around the territory and reclaim lost livestock. After a few years, the operation was able to lock down the whereabouts of the Bacchus Brother gang and eight other rustlers, and they arrested five, including two Bacchus brothers. This sent a signal to the rest of Mason and Gillespie counties that the German members of the communities were serious about finally cracking down on crime. Soon, however, the innocent approach to handling criminal affairs transformed into full-stop vigilante justice. After the Bacchus Brother gang and their cronies were thrown in the Mason County Jailhouse by Deputy John Worley, a member of the cattle hunting posse named Tom Gamble started a rumor that Sheriff Clark and Inspector Horster wanted the arrested party lynched. The gossip spread like wildfire through the town until a mob of about 40 descended the county jailhouse in the evening hours of February 18, 1875. Deputy Worley refused to hand over the keys 
and the mob resorted to a battering ram to open the cell doors and sweep away the prisoners. Nearby, Sheriff Clark was entertaining the likes of visiting Texas Ranger Dan W. Roberts. Neither he nor Inspector Horster had ever ordered a lynch mob, and were both incensed by the idea. When the sheriff and Texas Ranger men were alerted to the situation downtown, they rushed to the jailhouse, only to be told to stay back by armed members of the mob. Clark and Roberts attempted to push through, but ultimately walked back when threatened with a gunshot to the head. Unable to sit by the wayside, Sheriff Clark knew he couldn't let vigilante justice take root in his jurisdiction. Aided by the help of Ranger Roberts, Clark rounded up six other Mason County residents to bear arms and attempt to halt the mob's actions. By the time they tracked the horde of angry German ranchers to the south part of town, however, they were already too late. The mob had hanged both Elijah and Pete Backus, as well as their henchmen Abe Wiggins and Tom Turley, before Clark and Roberts spared the life of Charlie Johnson. The lynching of the Backus brothers would be the first of many conflicts that would eventually formulate the Hoodoo Wars of Mason County, Texas. Hoodoos were another name for vigilante citizens who ambushed imprisoned thieves and unsuspecting small-time bandits under the cloak of darkness. They would strike after midnight when most were asleep and unsuspecting, coating their face with charcoal and black paint to blend in with the shadows of the night. On March 25th of that year, the original gossiper Tom Gamble received word that he was the next target of the vigilante hoodoos. He rounded up a group of men to retaliate, but was stopped by Sheriff Clark, who had gathered 62 German immigrants to come together in peace talks. The two sides argued, but ultimately agreed that the lynchings and jailhouse mobs would end. Of course, the white flags didn't wave for long, as tensions brewed once more in May of that year. Cattle Inspector Horster had recently revoked a one-year prison bond for Tim Williamson, a very popular American in the community, for stealing a young calf. Williamson was working for Loyal Valley business tycoon Charlie Lemberg, who would pay $5 to cattle rustlers for unbranded cattle called Mavericks. Eventually, Williamson was arrested by Deputy Worley, but the two men couldn't even make it off Williamson's ranch before a mob of angry German ranchers caught wind of the situation. A German farmer by the name of Peter Bader took lead in the pack and was first to fire upon the American bandit. Williamson was killed on the spot, and yet Bader and the rest of the hoodoo mob escaped scot-free as a grand jury found them innocent after their May 12th trial. The Williamson execution then spurred the anger and resentment of his adopted son, Scott Cooley. Cooley was a former Texas Ranger turned farmer and a good friend to the Williamson family after they had taken him in. Cooley's birth parents had been slain by Native Americans, but he was rescued from captivity as a young boy by Tim and his family. Cooley had also served the Texas Rangers under legendary Company D leader, Captain Perry. He had retired only a few years prior and had resorted to a ranching life in Maynardville, Texas. Through the summer months of 1875, Cooley traveled down to Mason County to inquire about the death of his adopted father figure. He acted mostly anonymously, interviewing residents and acquiring names for exact details and involved names. On August 10th, Cooley decided that he had all the information he needed and stalked Sheriff Deputy Worley through town. When Worley was busy digging a well with his assistant, Doc Charlie Harcourt, Cooley walked up to Worley and shot him square in the back of the head. As a prize for his vengeance, Cooley scalped the deputy clean, showcasing the act for all to see and know what was coming for Mason County. Soon after, Cooley rounded up his own gang of vigilantes, including brothers John and Moe's Beard, George Gladden, and infamous Old West outlaw Johnny Ringo. Together, the posse terrorized the German residents and killed at least 12 men, all in cold blood. Cooley wasn't finished, however, and was hell-bent on taking the names of other responsible Mason County officials. He and his men set their sights on Peter Bader, the German farmer who had shot Williamson himself. During their recon operation, two of Cooley's gang members, Moe's Beard and George Gladden, were cut off and ambushed by a German mob consisting of Bader, Inspector Horster, and Sheriff Clark. Beard was shot dead, and Gladden was taken prisoner. In retaliation, Cooley hired Bill Koch to his ragtag team of vigilantes. Together, they successfully enacted revenge on Inspector Horster, who was shot riding past the Mason County Barbershop where Cooley and company were staked out at. Bill Koch was then lynched by another German hoodoo mob the next day, after letting his guard down in Mason County's bloody streets. 
It didn't take long after the slangs continued for Texas Governor Richard Koch, unrelated to the aforementioned outlaw, to order large factions of Texas Rangers to Mason and Gillespie counties. These factions were led by Major Jones, who recruited 10 of Scott Cooley's former fieldmates in Company D and 30 of Company A to provide security and law enforcement. Jones also dispatched a team of private detectives to trek through central Texas and locate the whereabouts of a now-wanted Scott Cooley. For two weeks, the rangers scoured the plains for signs of Cooley, but nothing ever came of it. A lawman from Texas by the name of Wilson Hay was assigned with the task of arresting the officials in Mason County who contributed to the bloodshed, and namely, Sheriff Clark. Clark was able to resign without incident and escaped never to be heard from again. The still-wanted Cooley gang member Johnny Ringo was also eventually caught, even after 15 members of Major Jones' security forces stepped out of rank with sympathy for their former fellow ranger, Scott Cooley himself. Nevertheless, enough of the Scott Cooley gang evaded capture to continue barraging Mason County with violence despite the presence of Texas Rangers. Johnny Ringo escaped their imprisonment, and in November of 1875, he and Cooley murdered Peter Bader and his brother Charlie. These would be the last major crimes committed by Cooley and his gang, leading to their ultimate arrest in December of that year. In 1876, Cooley and Ringo escaped with the help of sympathetic lawmen overseeing their imprisonment. Ringo departed for Tombstone, Arizona, where he ruffled feathers with Wyatt Earp and Doc Holliday. Scott Cooley, meanwhile, went into hiding in Blanco County. In the summer of 1876, news spread that Scott Cooley had died. However, the cause of death has never been solidified. Some say he died of brain fever, while others claim that he was poisoned by one last German hoodoo during dinner at the Nimitz Hotel in Fredericksburg. As for the rest of Mason County, tensions really didn't settle to pre-war levels until 1877. Various bands of hoodoo vigilantes continued lynching and mobbing jailhousers throughout the summer of 1876, and in January of 1877, the Mason County Courthouse was burned down. Along with it, all of the official records detailing the exact happenings of the Mason County War, making the bloody conflict all but an afterthought of the Wild West's infinite lawlessness. Unlike most family feuds and violent conflict across the West, the Tut Everett War, also known as the Marion County War, didn't revolve around water rights or sovereignty. Rather, the war was centered around two families who simply couldn't see past the other's political affiliation and their staunch supporters afraid that if their elected official lost their seat, personal favors would go by the wayside. The war began back in 1836, when Marion County was first formed by the Arkansas legislature, the same year that Arkansas was admitted into the Union. The county was first populated by various political supporters, but none more notable than the Everett family fierce defenders of the Democratic Party. The Everett family originally hailed from rural Kentucky, but sought new opportunities when Arkansas expanded their land dispersal. The Everett clan included the towering John, Sim, Jesse, and Bart Everett, all influential and hard-headed men in the newly formed community. At odds with Marion County's most affluent family was the Tut family from the neighboring Searcy County. The Tuts were from rural Tennessee themselves, but had moved to Arkansas Territory long before the Everett's and were miffed by the loss of Searcy County land as it was awarded to Marion County instead. Not only that, but the Tut family members were also very proud Whig Party constituents and worried that the addition of Southern Democrats in their vicinity would ruin the political prowess that they had held over the rest of the county. The Tuts were also fierce gamblers and drinkers. The family patriarch, R.B. Tut, fathered three boys in Ben, David, and Hansford Hamp Tut, who all helped manage a grocery store and saloon. In between their business duties, however, the men grew fond of horse racing, gambling, and fighting with anyone who stirred up trouble. Thus, when the Everett's marched through Marion County with a loud voice supporting the Democrats, the Whig-loving Tuts could not just stand by and watch peacefully. Sometime between 1844 and 1848, a political debate was hosted in Yellville, Arkansas, the Tuts arrived at the debate site with staunch supporters from Searcy County, who were forced to align with Marion County when county lines were redrawn. The debate quickly morphed into a brawl, and ended with a Tut family supporter and Whig party member Alfred Burns gashing an Everett brother's head with a hoe blade. 
The room emptied out in an instant as everyone believed the Everett brother to be dead. In a twist, however, the brother lived to tell the tale, and the rest of the Everetts saw a storm brewing unlike ever before as the arguments and fistfights carried into the end of the decade. The next major incident came in October of 1848, again involving Sim Everett and the folks of Yellville. This time, instead of fists, a gunfight broke out amongst Democrats and Whigs, with Sim falling injured before succumbing to his gunshot wounds. Knowing they needed to retaliate for a cold-blooded murder, the Everett family targeted not the Tut family themselves, but rather their strongest supporters in the King family. Two days later, on October 11th, the Everett's tracked down and killed old William King and his son Loomis. This sparked a series of monthly gunfights between the feuding families, usually amassing only injuries as the families avoided casualties despite the violence. By Independence Day of 1848, the Sheriff of Marion County, Jesse Mooney, had seen enough. Ewell Everett had been elected judge, while a fierce Tut supporter named George Adams was named law enforcement constable and the tensions refused to lessen with public offices now in question. Harkening back to his experiences hunting down outlaws and ending crime spurts, Sheriff Mooney handpicked a posse of lawmen to enforce security in Marion County and prevent any further gunfights. Little to his knowledge, another gunfight in Yellville had started just as Mooney brought his men together to deputize them. Mooney's posse ventured to the saloon where the Tuts had been ambushed by the Everetts, but they got caught in the crossfire as well. By the end of the fight, which saw members of both families throw down their guns and bash each other in with batons and knives, five men were found dead. This included Bart Everett on one side and Jack King, Davis, Ben, and Lunsford Tut on the other. A surviving member of the fight, Dave Sinclair, had long been hunted by the Everetts for initially executing their beloved brother, Sim. Dave ran away from Yellville in the aftermath, but was effortlessly tracked down by the remaining Everetts on July 5th and killed without trial. Jesse Everett also finally got word of the bloodshed his family saw since his retreat to Texas just a few years prior. Full of wrath, Jesse promised vengeance against the Tut family and returned to Arkansas to carry out his plan. Meanwhile, Sheriff Mooney continued his efforts to stop the violence and dispatched his eldest son, Thomas, to travel to Little Rock and plead for help from Governor Thomas Drew. Unfortunately, after his visit with the governor, Thomas never returned home and disappeared without a trace. A search party was sent out to locate the boy, but all they found was the carcass of his horse. To this day, Thomas Mooney's vanishing remains a cold case. However, it has long been suspected that one of the two feuding families had something to do with it. Regardless, Governor Drew went by his word and brought relief to the northern Arkansas region. He sent a militia to Carroll County, where various supporters of the Everett family were arrested. Yet after their six weeks in Carroll County ended, the militia left town only for their surviving Everett family members to break the arrested men out of jail. In the last major act of the Tut-Everett War, one of the highest ranking members of the Everett family hired a mysterious gunfighter by the name of the Dutchman. The Dutchman, argued to be both a bounty hunter and a regular old stranger, hailed from Texas, but his true identity was never discovered. Nevertheless, the Dutchman proved his worth when he tiptoed to the banks of Crooked Creek and shot the top member of the Tut family, Hansford Hamp Tut. Afterwards, he alerted the Everetts of a successful mission and left Arkansas never to be seen again. With the loss of their leader, the Tut family quickly dissolved their presence in Marion County. At the same time, the Everett family suffered additional losses with a sweeping cholera epidemic in 1849 and 1850 and the Tut-Everett War that dominated the latter half of the decade ended in a whisper. Ultimately, the Marion County War was one of the only major family feuds to occur in the state of Arkansas. Yet, like the more famous family conflicts of history, such as the Hatfields and McCoys, the Tut-Everett War symbolizes a time period in America we will most likely never see again, where even the smallest of disagreements ballooned into the bloodiest of battles lost in time to the overall lawlessness that plagued the western frontier. <laughs>